and welcome to Noise Creators Podcast, Episode 8. Today I'm very excited to be joined with Joey Sturgis. Joey is an accomplished producer. Uh, he's sold million, many millions of records with groups like Asking Alexandria, Of Mice and Men, We Came as Romans, Bless the Fall, Devil Wears Prada, Chunk No Captain Chunk, Attila, Amur. The list really does go on and on. Joey also, though, what makes him, I think, really interesting is he has his hands in tons of other things. Most notably, lately, he's launched a new service called Nail the Mix that is really, really cool and a great way for aspiring producers to learn. I'm absolutely impressed by it, what him, E.L., and Joel are doing with this. Um, as well, he has an amazing plug-in company called Joey Sturgis Tones, which you will hear me go on and on about. I have not had some plugins work their way into my workflow. I'm really picky and it's if two new plugins get put into my workflow a year, it's a miracle at times. And his uh, three of his last year just went right in and I just can't stop using them and really, really enjoy what he's been doing with that company. Uh, he's a smart guy and this podcast is a little different than our usual one uh, in that we kind of just have a free-flowing conversation about creativity, how he's working on things, and a few other things. Uh, and I think it's a really fun talk, so check it out. So when you first started, I think your sound really was a... There's a lot of producers over the years who've uh, come up with something a little bit new. Your sound seemed to be something where people really turn their heads. I think you had more of like a... Really took things to like a more cinematic display. Was there any influence that you could tell me about that really brought you to hear things the way you did when you first came on the scene? Yeah, when I first started, I wanted to just figure out how to get good productions. I mean, that was the first goal. And and when I started out, I didn't have, I had no idea what a click track was or how to use it. So there's actually albums out there without <laughs> that were recorded with no click. But around the time I started doing producing it became a good interest in a lot of people's minds to have additional stuff like keyboards and just sort of sound effects and things and Dev Wars Prada was one of the first bands that sort of had in the metalcore scene like a, a dedicated person to doing that at least as far as I knew so that was where uh, I first felt like I first heard it and what you were doing yeah yeah so we when we kind of got together it was just sort of an experiment to see like well you know songs don't have to be a four person band like guitar bass vocals drums like there's all kinds of stuff you can do and we would just experiment but i think some of the influence came into play with like uh, people like john feldman and he just kind of had these really interesting things going on in some of his productions that was a little bit later on not not like right early in the in the start but you know, he would have these um, sound effects and like all these little outtakes from the vocalist sprinkled through the song. And that kind of stuff inspired me as well. Um, I was looking up to uh, a range of different people because I also looked up to like Ross Robinson, which kind of did things in a completely opposite way. Um, so it was a little bit all over the map, but I think the biggest thing was just the fascination of nailing it like in the in the production, just trying to get this person's idea from w how they envision it to like better, you know, bigger than life. You know, I, I don't know why I just had that mindset. I just wanted everything that I did to be huge. Yeah. And um, I think you did. I, it, it's funny. Cause I remember there was an interview that I had read with you years ago. I want to say on like audio geek scene or something. I saw that you mentioned Ross and obviously I worked under Ross for a long time. And uh, it was always funny. Cause I kind of thought of you guys as the two, polar di uh, opposite sides of things because ross yeah. is so raw but like it's funny you're talking about not using a click track and ross still i think the cure record we did was that was the first one he did with a click track and well, uh well i almost uh um what's it called i almost like interned with him oh did you yeah what was happening though is around the time that that became an option i was making a pretty decent amount of money off of doing albums mm -hmm. and i would have had to throw that away obviously to go intern with them so i chose the money route because at that point i was like what am i really gonna get from this other than just being able to have a cool experience and say like oh i worked under ross robinson i don't know what that will really do for me in the future um 
because you know the music industry changes a lot and mm-hmm. it's hard it's hard to predict you know is our bands like slipknot gonna ever happen again and it kind of i kind of think not so you know sometimes the the person's in the right place at the right time doing the right thing and they become the the forefront you know the runner for that that type of that type of entertainment yes I, I, that, that's an interesting thing because it was like also the same thing i was at a place where it was like wow like i have songs on mtv all the time and, and it was like I guess I'm going to put my career on pause, and I did it, and, you know, it was funny, because, like, it did good for me, it, like, I can't say I ever regret it, but, yeah, there was, like, I lost two records with, like, bands I wish I produced, like, that went on to become humongous bands, because I was busy working under him, so, that's a funny tangential life thing, so, one of the things is, obviously, now, we're a lot of years down from when you first started, how do you now still say inspired, because I still still think like, you know, the, I, when I was doing my homework on what you've been doing recently, it still sounds very inspired. What do you do to not be burnt out and stay inspired? For me, I think it's to stay, to keep people mystified and to try and keep um, the thing, keep keep what you're doing exciting for others, especially people in the that are in the craft with you. It's kind of like being a magician, you know, I think you know how the trick works. It's not super fun for you anymore. But you keep innovating, keep trying to figure out how to do new, interesting sounding things, things that people wouldn't quite expect, stuff that's new for the band or the or the band's audience. And that just helps it keep that helps you stay and it helps you stay interested in what you're doing. And the other thing I like to do is just always try and take on projects that are a little bit out of your comfort zone because those will raise challenges that allow you to basically get further along in your craft i mean if you're always doing the same thing it's going to be easy mode and you'll you'll get stale so it's important to stay challenged as well can you give me an example of something you've done recently to stay challenged well i think one of the things that happens just not as as a case of natural progression is if you work with a band and they continue to get more and more successful the stakes get higher Mm -hmm. um there's there's more risks you know when you when you're on album number five and they're you know, multi-million dollar band, it's like, okay, these songs have to freaking rule because there's a giant staff and everyone's lives depend on it. So that's one way that it can stay challenging is if you just stick with a band that gets more and more successful. The other way is like, if you're, let's say you do like rock music and then you take on sort of a, maybe a, a metal project, which is kind of going deeper down that rabbit hole. I think that that's a good challenge to take on or, or a, um, in the opposite direction, maybe you're a rock guy and you you want to do some kind of like pop project or something. Those are the kind of things that will expand your mind and expand your ability. One of the reasons why I did one of the reasons why I did what I did was I started listening to pop music and embracing the sort of high polished, perfected sound that it had and tried to incorporate it into rock and, and metal. You know, the thing the thing I experienced with, with producing rock and metal early on was that it always sounded kind of like crap. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and I was always searching for the way of like, well, how can I get this riff, this guitar riff to sound better? I don't understand why it, it sounds like messy or whatever. And uh, over time, it became like, oh, I, I just need to choose the right takes and I need to combine the right takes together to make this sound like flawless like it like it's the most perfect time that anyone's ever performed the riff which is kind of similar to how pop you know is constructed and so that's where it all came from was just to take influences from other genres of music com- and put it into what I was doing with with an unlikely genre like metal or rock and I think you can do the same thing with producing in terms of challenging yourself yeah, that's really cool. And I think that's one of the things with the pop music thing is it's like, I have a lot of trouble listening to a lot of vocals now and other things. And people are like, I can't believe you don't like that record. And it's like, well, I know how to do all that. I know how to make a vocal sound shitty and raw. And like, I know what to do to do that. But when I hear like Katy Perry Teenage Dream, that's something different to me. And uh, I want to do it. And like, I think that but what I do like that you're saying and something I've been really obsessed with lately is... um. The author Twyla Tharp calls this a metaphor quotient where you can see things in movies or something and apply it to a different art or a different trading. And uh, 
it seems like that was a lot of what you brought to this uh, in the middle. Yeah, on the like, other end of the spectrum in terms yeah. of adding things to the songs, it was all about, like, you know, the huge blockbuster action movie, like, you know, sound effects, the, the giant trailer bombs and <laughs> all that stuff. It just, mm. what it was cool was it was trying to make the superhero version of the band, which is kind of like my trademark, I think, really, is just... I can take a band and, and, and turn their their songs into the, the superhuman, the superhero version and get the comic book character version of their album, which I really like to do and I think is just kind of now it's like, I, I feel like it's raised the bar for a lot of productions uh, across the board. I don't know if I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say that I'm single-handedly responsible mm. for that. <laughs> no, no, yeah, but obviously you were a part of a movement. And yeah, definitely. And somebody. I mean, like you know, I, I've I've jokingly called it THX Core before, and before <laughs> that, before that, and before we knew each other, I'd call it Sturgis Core because you were the name involved with it. <laughs> well, you hear it. That's the thing. Um, after I did what I did, and the bands did what they did, like it became a thing now, and you can go check out hundreds and hundreds of, of productions, and they all have those THX core elements in them. <laughs> yes. One of the things I always find frustrating, and I think this is a very common thing, is like you'll see these like boneheaded like guys in the rock world, and they'll see like a girl band, for example, and they'll be like, oh, somebody's writing their songs for them. I feel like that was a common trope with like what everybody feel like you felt like you were doing with bands. I really like that you just said that superhero version of it. What do you have to say when people say that you're making this band compared to what I usually perceive as is is a band comes in with some great ideas and it's just a matter of that you're able to take it up to a different percentage. Yeah, so obviously there's two sides to this because you've got the one side where someone can write a great idea and you can turn it into a great song. And then sometimes you have um, people who, well, let me step back. So there's definitely situations where I had to write things like from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, just right off the bat, all across the board. There's not a single one way this works. I mean, every single band's different. Every single song's different. Sometimes I'd have people come in and they would have three, three or four 45 second ideas and we had to make an album. Wow. So in those cases, I am writing stuff and in the proper, I, but don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong or anything. Yeah. If that's what's going into it up front and everyone knows that there's a way to be compensated for that. There's a way to make that take advantage of that too, and and come out with a great album. But then you've got the situations where someone comes in with you know ten three minute ideas, and then you just elevate it. It's the same thing like like a chef would do. Like he can, everyone can make a steak, but he can just make it taste so much better because he mm -hmm. elevates it a little bit. So it's the same thing. Like it's still a steak, but I've got special seasoning <laughs> and a special way of preparing it that mm -hmm. will make it amazing i think it's just a matter of there's two things one knowing who you're working for and what their expectation is and then also knowing what the consumer's expectation is and if you can play with those two points that's how you can really like kill it in this industry that's the two things you need to do i think that's really really interesting way of looking at it getting back to the inspiration one of the things that seems like you've been doing lately is you branched off into making the software that people use to create music. I've been particularly really impressed with what you've done. And it, admittedly, I'm one of those people that when I see a new plugin company, I'm very hard to convert because I just, you know, if you're not that guy from who makes Melodide and don't look like a wizard um, creating something <laughs> weird, like I'm just, I'm just not buying that you're going to do something impressive for me and man like i've just been blown away like i was telling you before we started taping that your dfx site plugin has probably worked its way into my normal rotation faster than any plugin has and the clip plugin i just love i use the uh, compression plugin a lot um tell me about how you got started with this and what it's been evolving into sure so um the whole thing really honestly started with a bet my friend has this tendency to challenge me and he'll just say, dude, you should do this. And I'm, I always, 
<laughs> always, always, always shrug them off and like, dude, no, I can't do that, man. That's too hard. And he was like, dude, you should make plugins. It'd be so cool. And I was just like, I don't know how to make plugins. I don't have time to make plugins. So one day I, I had like 48 hours off, which is rare for my schedule. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to actually kind of look into this whole plugin thing. Like four days later, <laughs> I took like two extra days off when I shouldn't have. And I ended up sort of like with a really rough working prototype of a compressor that wasn't anything special, but it was compressing stuff. And uh, so time and time goes on and I keep experimenting with this every time I get a little opportunity. And eventually I started to really get into it and kind of figure out how DSP works and how compression works and all this. And I made my first prototype and I started testing it on stuff that I was working on. I was working on like an all-girl metal band. I was working on a couple of like metalcore projects. I, I was mixing stuff with the, my company, Mixing Bros, um, which is just music that's like all over the map and testing my, my own like prototype on all this stuff. And it was sounding really cool. So I decided to try it, put it online and see if people would even spend money on it. Just to, just the concept of here's a producer who, who has, you know, plenty of uh, stuff that he's done that people see. And here's a thing that he created. Let's see if anyone cares. And people did. Uh, we put out a beta and a lot of people bought it and uh, it earned enough money to where I could kind of take it seriously. And I, I contacted a programmer and said, hey, can you help me turn this into, you know, like a Mac equivalent version and something that's compatible with Pro Tools, blah, blah, blah. Because the first version I made was only compatible with Cubase. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he helped me do that. We relaunched it and it did extremely well. And the whole sort of the whole company is really built on that first plugin. And then, you know, once, once all that stuff happened, it kind of clicked in my head. I was like, Oh, I know what I can do now. I can help people make great music in multiple ways. It, it was sort of like discovering my, my mission in life. Hmm. Cause, Cause before I just looked at myself as a producer, but now I was like, wow, not only can I help people make great music by producing, I can help people make great music with, education with plugins with tutorials with videos and it just sort of clicked and now everything makes so much sense with all the st different things that i'm doing like my podcast and the boot camps and that i do with al levy all that kind of stuff it's all kind of packaged in there along with that plug-in stuff and doing things like this being on your show yeah, and so speaking of what you do with the owl, I, I have to say is, you know, I've been somebody who's been in recording forums. I, I realized that it, was, it is 20 years this year, and I think you guys are one of the only communities that is really good and positive, and when I go in there, I don't cringe at the stupidity or the people being horrible. Can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing and how you've gotten that community to be great? Well, it started 10 years ago. That's the hard part about it is uh, I've been trying to do this for as long as I can remember. And it's been a challenge. We, we've we had several communities pop up and, and disappear because they just didn't work. The first one we did was on this thing called Ultimate Metal Forum where, you know, sort of Andy Sneap has his famous forum there. I got to a point where I finally got my own forum and we did pretty well, but it got kind of weird because some of the people on there are just a little too over the top in terms of being opinionated. I don't think any, the thing with those communities is sometimes I don't think they, they look at it as a community. They just look at it as like a place to, to get, get, get and not give, give, give. Mm, um, I like that a lot. Right. So that, that's why those things, de de they deconstruct because you just go there, grab what you need, and you leave. And uh, when everyone's doing that, it just doesn't work. So then we did, uh, we had a Facebook forum that was pretty popular, and it collapsed because we just didn't have the mindset on how to properly manage it. You know, what type of posts should and should not be allowed, and it just became a, a marketplace for advertising stuff like, hey, I do lyric videos. Does anyone want? A lyric video, hey, I reamp guitars, $25 per reamp, and just, it's like, what's the point of coming here? It's just classified ads. 
so we shut that down that fell apart and there was some drama related to like you know beef in the industry and stuff that also helped uh sink the ship so a couple years go by and i come back to it and i'm like now that i have this new outlook like knowing oh okay i understand my mission now it just made so much more sense to start the community again with the right rules in place which is like you know no advertising um, your posts have to at least be eight words. You can't just like post something with one word, you know, no cussing in the original post, just, you know, like a list of things like 10 rules. And just the, the biggest thing that I think made it really work was finding one moderator per thousand people. Oh, that's interesting. So we've got five, I think we've got even more than that. I think we've got like seven moderators, but we've got like 5,000 people there. And that way, you know, around the clock, there's people watching this thing like a hawk, making sure that it works really well. And uh, it's it's really, it's, it's for conversion. I mean, we we offer a great place to learn and get information, but this is a pool of people that care about what we're doing. And we do a lot of things. So it really helps with conversion. And I think they understand that, you know, that we just need a place to call home. And that's kind of what we've created. And I think a lot of people get a lot out of it. It's it's a good place to connect with like-minded people as well. Yeah, I, I think you guys do a very good job. I, I have a, a Facebook forum. Um, the Defend Pop Punk group is sadly mine, and it's 30,000 people. And even with 25 moderators, we can't keep up with that. So I'm going to steal your one per thousand uh idea and think about that. So as you've been going into this plug-in thing and going into these podcasting endeavors, you're also on the side of, I mean, obviously as producers, we're always on the side of that, you know, if a musician's not making money, uh, we're not making money on our points. But have you learned any lessons that would go into like streaming music and YouTube? And wh what have you been seeing now being on this new side of things? Well, uh, let me give you a little backstory because when I started, some of my best albums, the ones that have sold millions collectively, I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have producer points on those. I didn't have agreements with those, con with those records. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my main core of my success is not attached to sort of any royalties or anything, hmm. which is really sad because I wish it was. But the lesson I learned was getting a good entertainment lawyer was probably one of the best decisions. Uh, regard, you know, the, when you first get into this, you're looking at this as like, okay, what are my expenses? And I had a pretty lucrative setup. I mean, my house that I was recording records at, I didn't even have a recording studio. I was just recording albums in a house. And the house was like $800 a month mortgage. Wow. So, I mean, I recouped in one day pretty mm -hmm. much, you know. So it was like, it was kind of lucrative. But when you look at getting a lawyer, you're like, wow, this is expensive. It's going to cost me X, Y, Z. However, I can tell you that that's worth it because the amount of understanding you get for the industry and, and what and how all this stuff works and what's going on behind the scenes is almost priceless because it gives you the ability to sort of seek out uh, opportunities you wouldn't have thought of before. At least that's how it worked for me. So I guess my takeaway was get a great lawyer, uh, learn more about the industry, and then you'll learn more about what, how you can fit into different like sort of puzzle pieces, I guess. One of the things that I always do is if I play anything on the album or if I write anything, I always take a percentage of writing. But just because that's just, for me, that's the formality. That's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And I suggest everyone do the same because I do see a lot of people grabbing that guitar or doing some harmony layers or whatever, playing a keyboard and not taking any points or any writing for it. And uh, I think that's kind of sad because that's the way the industry wants it to work. And it's not fair. Agreed. You guys have obviously been very strong with YouTube, with the podcast and everything. Has there been any marketing lessons you've been learning that you think musicians would like to know? Yeah. So I'll just say that I've experimented a lot with print ads, web ads, or ad, sorry, web ads, and uh, Facebook advertising and a lot of different things like that. And what I found to be the most effective thing is to just literally collaborate with other people who have audiences that aren't yours. And that sounds really simple, but it, it works. 
for example, JST has, we've always been extremely... JST being Joey, Joey Sturgis Tones, your plug-in company. Yeah, we've always been incredibly honest because I always believe that if we, you know, you could have a company who's like, who figures out how to just do like faked reviews or something, or maybe they do like, you know, they pay people to like do these videos to, to make sure that the, that the sort of... Uh, uh, the opinion of the product is is good or whatever with without forming an actual real opinion i don't think that's that's like a slippery slope because eventually you won't be able to pay enough money to keep up with you know with what's going on you have to have good products it's just bottom line if you have a great product and you give it to someone else and they form the same opinion then you've got a great product on your hands so that's first and foremost you you've got to start there and this, and when I say product, I, I'm talking about anything. It could be producing albums. That's your product, right? Mm-hmm. Once you can make it available for other people to see the same value that you that you believe you're offering in your product, then you will grow. And that was part of my growth was just finding great opportunities to collaborate with people. So with JST, it could be like a video uh, on Toneforge Menace and mm-hmm. just having someone demonstrate what it sounds like when they play through it and reaching that person's audience, whoever, whoever it is that's doing the video. And that worked really well for us better than Facebook advertising, better than print advertising, better than web advertising, just straight up collaborating on a video. And most of the times that can be free. And I would say to anyone out there who's really into business and marketing, like just really take a serious look at YouTube. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be advertising on YouTube because we tried that too and it didn't work. It just could mean that you just need to be in more places where there's bigger audiences. Um, even if you just show up to talk or you hang out with somebody that you know vlogs or something, it's just it's good exposure and and to me, I think it's the most effective way to do anything in 2015 yeah it's a little the the show don't tell it's just the same way record reviews don't work anymore because everybody just want you know we now live in an era where we can just see and experience it instead of listening to somebody else tell us about it yeah there's no obscurification of like you know you can just type in the song name on youtube and it pops up and you don't (laughs) yep I saw that you recently recommended Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, which is one of my favorite books of the last year. Is there anything that you've been reading that's been really inspiring you? Pretty much just that one. Uh, I think I've, I'm really into, like, I guess, the social aspect to the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to learn a lot about that. So I've been reading the, uh, the famous Dale Carnegie book. Oh, yeah. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. So that's a good book. You can actually find it for like 95 cents in some places. It's a very cheap book. I think the main takeaway from the book is when you're approaching other people, people are selfish. Uh, People like to think about themselves. They care about their own lives more than anything else. Of course, there's people out there that are selfless. The main point is like, okay, when you're talking to someone or approaching someone, it's all about what value do you bring to them and if you approach most things in life that way, even the simplest things as like grocery shopping and speaking to the cash register person, like it, it comes down to all aspects. If you can bring value to other people or you can make things, put, them in, put it in a perspective to where they see what they can get out of it, you'll go really far and you'll have a lot of opportunities. It's awesome advice. What's the biggest mistake you see bands doing before they get to the studio? If it's the biggest mistake... I, I, it could be one a, a one of any, sure. I want to say the biggest mistake is not having enough time to focus on your album. Touring schedules are just brutal mm-hmm. these days. And a lot of people will tour 11 months and try to do an album in the 12th. It just doesn't work. It's getting easier because mobile recording is, is more accessible and keeps growing that way. But it's still not quite there. I've, I've had countless albums that just come in unprepared just four songs we got to do 10 or we've got 10 songs but the, the drummers never played any of the drum beats before because we programmed them on our laptop like just crazy stuff like that it's just really hard to work through and i think the obviously the booking agents and the managers want the band to be touring all the time because they take a percentage of the cut and that's how they make their money so 
it's kind of inevitable that it'll never get fixed. It just seems as if that's the way things roll. But uh, if bands really cared, I, I would say they should demand um, more time to focus on their album. I, I think it's ironic what you're saying, too, and this is one of the big things I've been focusing on with my new startup, is that the best marketing tool you have is a great record. Just like <laughs> yeah. we were talking about in the last thing, yet none of the managers, booking agents, record labels seem to let bands focus on doing that because they treat it as if it's this accident that happens to a good band. Yeah, and, and I think... I think uh, a lot of times they might think we can just make an album and then just whatever it is, we can push it. And of course, there's going to be some sort of quality control, a level of like, well, it has to be this good at least, you know. But I've, I've seen time and time again where, you know, I've had a band come in, we do an album, we turn it in and nobody says anything. You know, it's just like, OK, it's like they expect it to just either work or not and they don't really metal in between i think the best albums that i've worked on were pretty well prepared some of the bigger ones were literally like the band showed up and i hit play on the demo and i was like yep we got a great song here just need to do this this and this and we're you know we're in the green those are the biggest albums you know the best selling albums that i've done are are situations like that I think that that's very telling because it's also the thing of this, like it's much like uh, when directors often talk about that when they get a great script, they don't have to sit there and rewrite it the whole time. They can just focus their thinking on camera shots and how the character's performance is instead of focusing on rewriting parts all day. Yeah. So then what's a smart thing that some bands do during the recording process? Is there any, I, I think one of the things that I don't see enough advice on is what you can be doing while you're actually in the studio that affects making a better record. Practicing is one of the bigger things that I always, you know, when it comes to drums, I'm a drummer myself and I played drums when I was a kid. So when I approach a record, one of the first things I look at is like, what kind of drum fills is he playing? Where is he putting his kick drums? Why isn't he hitting a crash here? Blah, 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 blah. All those things stacked up. We spend a lot of time, I'll spend the whole week just going through every drum, every single drum hit on the album with the drummer, sitting down there, analyzing it all, making changes and tweaks, and getting to a point where we have this sort of almost finished product of what the drums are going to be for the album. And I'll hand it to them on an iPod or whatever, and I'll say, here, Go listen to this and, and practice it, air drum it, uh, play on some practice pads, go rent out a studio, go play an actual drum kit. You're not allowed to record drums until you can play this. <laughs> huh, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, practice is one big thing because I care about the person not only being able to do what I want them to do with their music, but also being able to challenge themselves because I think in order to progress someone's sound they have to be challenged and if you're just doing the same old simple drum beats then you're not really are you really pushing yourself and are you really doing what's necessary f or or what's right for your audience and your career so i always like to do that and the other thing is uh i see a lot of people kind of wasting time in terms of um, playing video games or whatever mm -hmm. it is facebook and stuff which nowadays, I mean, you could argue that the Facebook and the Instagram and the Twitter and all that stuff just helps market the band, but I the don't video know. Video games guess, don't. <laughs> yeah, video games don't. That's and, what I uh, was thinking of when I when I thought of this question. That's that's exactly what I was looking at. Is the kid playing the video game? Yeah, like come on, do at least get on Twitter and interact with your fans, or you know, put together some kind of contest. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's not really great for the album, but at least it's something constructive. But uh, practicing, and if there's anything left in the album that's unfinished, uh, how about you finish it? And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Instead of finishing that level. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I think that's interesting is you're talking about how much you go over with this stuff. I know you and I do a similar thing where we have other engineers record certain parts of the records. Can you take me through some of the philosophy behind that and how you execute that? Sure. Well, when I first started, I did everything myself. And for a while, that was okay, because I didn't really have anything else going on. But now that I have a lot of things going on, it's really impossible for me to do a whole album myself, um, unless the band is willing to take a super long time to do it. 
because it'll just stretch out over time. So my philosophy not only was about saving time, it was also about saving sort of headspace. And what I mean by that is being, being able to step outside of the process a little bit, have someone else record all those guitar parts, have someone else record those drums, and then being able to look at it more objectively because you weren't there for the creation of some of it allows your mind to sort of wander a little more and imagine a little more and become more of a, what I would call pr traditional producer. I can look at a song and I can look at a vocal part and I can be like, that vocal part's not very good. It might have taken them eight hours to get that vocal part the way it is now, but I'm still willing to say, nah, not good enough because I wasn't there for those eight hours and I don't know how long it took. And I tell my engineers, I'm like, don't tell me, I don't want to know you know, what you went through to get this, because I want to look at it extremely objectively. I want to look at this and be like, is this good or not? And not be swayed one way or the other, depending on how long it took or how hard it was. I just want to be, you know, hard hitting and make sure that every part is freaking as great as we're going to get it. Agreed. I think it's like one of those funny things too, is you take Rick Rubin, who's obvious, uh, arguably the most successful producer in rock, who doesn't even show up most days and then just comes in, lays down and listens. And, you know, bands will hate him for that, but their his record is inarguable for it. And I often talk about it like I'm able to, because I do the same thing. It's like I haven't rec recorded a guitar in about 10 years and I did it all myself at first, but I'm not punch drunk from punching in so many times that you're just like, all right, this has got to be done. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> the, other, the other side of it, too, is I think it opens up an opportunity for more creativity. I've noticed that uh, when I don't hear the song 5,000 times, mm -hmm. it, uh, it still sounds fresh to me when I hear it. Like, you know, let's say we just finished guitars. I come back to it and I listen to it. I've maybe, I've maybe heard the song only 10 times at that point, And now I hear it with fresh guitars and I'm just like, oh, man, this would be really cool if we did this. When mm -hmm. we did that, and I have all these ideas that I wouldn't have had if I had sat there and recorded that, you know, that song all day. Because I don't know. That's just that's just naturally how it comes. When you approach something fresh, you have your own little your own little twist on it. Yeah, it's like, like Greg Wells has that really good saying that uh, the hardest thing about producing a record is that you can't hear it the way a first time listener hears it. Yeah, and trying to maintain <laughs> that is one of the most important things. So he has like the thing of like, he has another engineer work on it. He only works eight hour days, which that I can't understand how you do, but it's, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting thing. Yep. I totally agree with that. That's, that's the magic for sure. So what happens when you and a band disagree about something greatly? Um, I will, if it, if it gets to the point where it's just a hard black and white, um, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm a servant to them. So if they don't, if they really are not receptive to something, even if I think it's the right thing, at the end of the day, it's it's not my album; it's theirs. So it'll it'll eventually end up back into their court, and they kind of make the decision. So I always say, you know, hey, you're paying me to tell you what I think. I'm telling you what I think. Feel free to pay me to ignore me if you'd like. Uh, I don't mind. Um, What's one of the best moments you've had in the studio? It's a great question. <laughs> I, I, when I got asked it the first time, I went, wow, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the hardest one I've gotten in a while. Um, I've had a lot of really awesome moments. Uh, they're all sort of like kind of weird. Like I, I'll, I'll just share a few. Uh, one time I got to actually work in the main room at NRG. I think that was mm. really just awesome. Um, especially for someone like me who had been making albums for eight years in his garage or bedroom um yeah just uh, instantly get plopped up from that situation and then dropped into NRG main room uh that was fun <laughs> that's, that's um fun. another great moment was uh one time i was actually working on this song and uh we had hired an orchestra to play some parts that we wrote um and what we did is we we literally just opened up like a MIDI roll with a fake string plug-in or whatever, wrote some parts and then just, you know, printed it on audio and sent the MIDI and so, like, here you go. And it came back and it was freaking amazing, man. Wow. Like just incredible. Like that was a moment I'll never forget because hearing real strings played by real players and, and like they added like little things that, you know, you didn't necessarily write in there. 
not necessarily note changes, but just like how they transition from note to note and stuff. That was really nice. And uh, I guess another one of the top moments would be I recorded uh, a singer by the name of Lights. She has the most incredible control over her voice. I mean, she can just do like literally anything and she has perfect pitch and it was kind of weird and the first time i recorded her you know we got everything all set up and we go to record the first pass and and uh she does it and i i I stop like immediately afterwards i think i even cut off some of the tail a little bit and i was like ah hold on uh sorry i i left autotune on (laughs) <laughs> and I, I go into my mixer and I try to find this auto tune and it, there, it's not there. And I was like, "Holy crap! Your pitch is so on point that I thought this was actually auto tuned." <laughs> I've had that once before, and it's pretty wild. Yeah, so um, that's my top three, I think. What was one of the worst moments? Not that you need to name names, and what'd you learn from it? Oh man. <laughs> One of the worst moments ever was when this band came in. It was a stranger band. What I mean by that is I I'd never met them before. It was supposed to be a quick project. No real intentions of doing a second album or anything with them. It was just kind of like a quick pick-me-up project, you know, doing a favor for a label. So the band comes in, starts showing me their songs. And first listen, I was a little off-put. I was like, uh, okay, not quite like the best songs ever. We can probably fix that start diving into the songs more and more and realizing these people do not know how to write music. There were just chromatic parts and just chromatic harmonies and stuff, like two notes next to each other, Mm. like all over the place to the point where it was just not fixable. And Mm. uh, it was just a nightmare of a situation. Just getting through that month was just... Oh, like the the guy was tone deaf. He couldn't harmonize with himself. He would sing a different melody every time. The other guy was way too old to be in the band and screamed like a like a J- Japanese suicide bomber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was just a bizarre time and a bizarre project, and uh, I actually removed my name from it, so no one. Oh wow! Know. I was going to ask you how the record did. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was an interesting one, but uh, that's the only time I've ever. I've ever pulled my name from something because I typically I wouldn't do that. You know, that's not fair, but I had to on this one. It was just a point of no, there was just a point of no return. There was no way to save it. It's funny. Every time I've asked this question, everybody has exactly one record they've done that with. Oh, really? <laughs> it, like exactly. Uh, I mean, for me, me too. It's one record. I was like, do not put my name on this. Do not do anything. I hate you. I don't want to ever see you again. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very similar. The same thing is singing a different melody every time they got they punched in a vocal. Yeah, and it's like, just, do you even know what you're doing? Like, <laughs> how is this even a song? You know. On the opposite side of the perspe- uh, spectrum, uh, what's your favorite record of recent times, and what inspires you about it? I don't know if people are going to hate me or love me for this. Uh, actually, I, I would lean on hate me, which is fine. Um, I'm a big Mutt Lang fan, so oh, I yeah, follow, same here. Follow what he does. And I have to say, man, the the Dark Horse record he did with Dark, uh, Nickelback was amazing. And I like, I also like the record they did after that, which didn't involve Mutt Link, but you could tell they learned something from him. They did Here, Here and Now. Those are the two recent records. I don't really like their newest album. It's a little bit, I don't know what what they did. I guess they just hired like pop writers to write pop songs. It's pretty weird. It's d- definitely not rocky rock rock and roll or anything like that. But uh, I like those those two albums. Um, there was another one. I actually like this album. Well, I'll I'll, I'll name two more. Uh, I like this album, the Zach Brown Band. Um, it's a country artist. Dave Grohl found them and kind of did some stuff with them. To listen to that. It's freaking amazing, dude. Uh, just unstoppable songs. And then. Uh, the other one is there's actually uh, an interesting thing that happened. Do you, I don't know if you remember, there was a viral video of all these people playing a single guitar and singing that Giotti song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go so, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're called Walk Off the Earth. Um, mm-hmm. They got signed to like Columbia or something and uh, put out an album, and it's actually pretty cool. I like it. So there, there you go. I like those three albums. Cool. What do you wish you knew when you started your career if you wish you could have known it through the whole career? <laughs> I wish I could have understood music law a lot better, mm. and I wish I would have had a lawyer 
those two things alone would have done tenfold for, for me now. And they, now that I know them, they're helping me a lot, but it would have helped more if I had known it early on in my career. Now, the, the difficult part of that is when you're young and you're starting out, you just do not have the resources to know who's the right person and you don't have the money to afford them. So it's a very interesting problem because I'm not really sure what the answer is on how to do it early on other than just it's an investment that will pay for itself in the long run. And just having a, having a contract between you and the client just goes a long way and really helps when some, when, when stuff goes bad, um, <laughs> it can help you uh, determine what is the right uh, outcome. Great advice. What is the best lesson you've learned from another musician? The best lesson I've learned from another musician is that sometimes music doesn't make sense. And that's why it's great. Hmm. Um, was, you know, I, I've had uh, chords that just shouldn't, they just shouldn't work, but they do in certain cases. And uh, if you know a lot of music theory, you know, you'll instantly shut that down and be like, nah, that's not right. You can't play this. But uh, sometimes it's the stupid stuff that's really good. So I would say keep it, um, what's the word? What's that, uh, that word when you're like young? And, oh, keep it naive. Naive, yeah. This is yeah. this is this is like the advice that uh, every uh, smart, creative person always says. Is like the naive thing. You got to have like a sense of naivety to what you do because that's where sort of original sparks of of like uh, greatness, I think, come from. Honestly, what area of the music business do you think people don't? understand how bad it is to change and what do you see that could change it i think the biggest problem we have with the music industry right now is streaming the reason why it just doesn't pay enough and of course the streaming companies say well we we made three billion and we paid 2.5 billion so we're barely even making any money off of this or whatever and that looks good and everything but it just isn't enough and I'll tell you, I think the solution to streaming is to cap it and then tier the pricing. So we could say, yeah, you're paying $9 a month, but you only get 10,000 streams. That way you can at least charge $19.99 a month for another 10,000 streams, or maybe maybe it exponentially grows in, in the streams or something. That would give them more revenue and the ability to pay the artist more per stream um, because there would be a cap and then they could predict you know, how many streams there are going to be, which would enable them to pay more. So that's my my problem and solution for the music industry right now. I think that that is what's going to happen. I think they're just really waiting till everybody's too addicted to go back to torrents. Yeah. Recommend something that's non-self-promotional okay. uh, that you've been enjoying. Like it could be a book, movie, art, whatever, just something non-self-promotional. I'm really into video stuff right now. Yeah, go 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 for it. I would say, I mean, it, so it can be anything? Uh, anything that's not self-promotional, that's like, you know, something people can ingest. Uh, I'd say one thing that's really awesome, if you haven't known about it or checked it out before, is uh, creativelive.com. The ability to learn from people who aren't necessarily educators, but are in the industry and have been there and have done it. It's really awesome to get an interesting insight on where everyone comes from and, and how they got to where they are or, or how they do what they do. And I've learned a lot from there. And I know this is kind of more related to audio. So they have a really great audio channel and program there. Lots of really amazing things you can learn. I, I've taught there myself, so it is a little bit on the self-promotional side. But um, there's obviously way more people presenting there than just me. And uh they all have great quality content, and so Creative Live, I would say, is a really awesome thing to check out. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, you know, as another one of the instructors there, dude, like, I just did the course on storytelling they did to try to get better at doing some of, like, the things I'm working on, and I, like, it was so much better than the last five books I read. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a, a company I'm so proud to say I'm involved in. Right, yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, your course was great, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, I just, uh, I don't necessarily get as much time as I'd hoped for to do those. Mm -hmm. Like they're very, very, like I put it together literally about 12 hours before I got on the plane. Wow. 
just because that's how my schedule rolls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, it turned you know people like it. it turned out yeah. great. So <laughs> I mean, that, that's so, so, sometimes the thing, as you know, it's like sometimes flying by the seat of your pants just gets it all out. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just took notes for three months while I thought about it, and then just each time just would. I was definitely thinking about it for a long yeah. time, so that that was probably just the build up I needed to finally ink it on paper. I think that's one of the things too is people underestimate that. Like they always say, like. How long did it take you to do this book? How long did it take you to do that? I'm like, well, I took notes for four years. <laughs> was I really ever devoting a day to it? No, but I took notes for four years and I wrote it in six months. Yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the golden rule of the internet, that if you enjoy something you got for free, please tweet, Facebook share, or tell your friends about it in whatever way you like to do that. Please check out Noise Creator's website and take a look around. We have tons of interviews, discographies, Spotify playlists from all the best producers out there on our service. If you're unsure about who your band should work with, we can help you get the best producer fit for your record. To keep up with us, follow at Noise Creators on Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, Tumblr, or Facebook. This podcast can be also be found wherever podcasts are found, including iTunes and Stitcher. I'm your host, Jesse Cannon. I can be found on Twitter at Jesse Cannon or at jessecannon.com. Again, please help spread the word about this podcast and what Noise Creators does so we can keep this going.